This is a brief video on tumors of the nervous system. We're going to be talking about several tumors that are found in the nervous system. Uh, they're listed across the left here. It's most helpful if you can organize these in your head to, uh, to help remember them. And these are some categories to help you organize them. The most important of the embryonal tumor is medulloblastoma. We're going to be talking about that in depth in a second. The next Four there are astrocytomas, which mean that they are tumors derived from astrocytes. They are part of the bigger category called gliomas, which are tumors that arise from glial cells. And the other two types of glial cells and the tumors they produce are listed after that. Oligodendrocytes produce oligodendrogliomas, and ependymal cells produce ependymomas. Next, there are meningeal tumors, which uh, which big one is meningiomas, come from meningeal cells. And then there are the peripheral tumors, including the neurofibromas and the schwannomas. Now, we're going to be given a short summary of each of these and some of the key histologic and other pathologic and clinical features that can help you identify these tumors of the nervous system. Let's begin with medulloblastoma. This is an embryonal tumor. This is one of the higher grade tumors. It's a grade four malignant tumor. The WHO has a scale, a grade one, two, three, or four for these, and this is one of the higher ones. It arises from external granular layer in the cerebellum. It comes from a embryonal tissue. On histology, we see small, round, blue cells. We see homorite rosettes, which can be seen in this histology on the right, and the cells are often mitotically active. So you might see them dividing, you might see them separating uh, in nuclei. These cell, uh, these, excuse me, these tumors are usually located in the cerebellum, below the tectoral line. This is one of the tumors that can drop metastases to seed the CSF medulloblastoma can see the CSF. These are usually not diffuse. They're usually not spreading and invading throughout the brain. They're well circumscribed tumors. Next is pilocytic astrocytoma. Pilocytic astrocytoma, like medulloblastoma, is, uh, is common in children. This is a grade one. This one is relatively benign. On imaging, you see a solid nodule with a cystic component. This is an important differentiating feature. If you see a solid tumor-like nodule with a watery sac next to it, a cystic component, could be pilocytic astrocytoma. This is also common in the cerebellum, also in the hypothalamus and optic nerve. This one is also non-diffuse, it's well circumscribed. And on histology here, you see Rosenthal fiber and eosinic granular bodies. You can see Rosenthal fibers in that picture at the bottom left there. And finally, one mutation, uh, one molecular feature is is, uh, is the BRAF mutation that's associated with pilocytic astrocytoma. This is the first of the four astrocytomas that we're going to be talking about. They're going to get continuously higher in grade as we go down the list. Next two astrocytomas are diffuse astrocytoma and anaplastic astrocytoma. These are uh, not too notable, uh, so we're going to talk about them together. So diffuse astrocytoma is a grade two it's malignant. This one is diffuse, unlike the others that we've talked about. These are most common in the cerebral hemispheres above the tectoral line. On histology, you see that this is a hypercellular tumor, way more cells, way more blue or purple than you're used to seeing on histology. Molecular, there is no 1P, 19P codeletion. Now, this may not make much sense here, but as we go on, we're going to see, uh, I believe it's oligodendrogliomas that do have this deletion, and it will help you differentiate between the gliomas. Anaplastic astrocytoma, pretty similar. This one's grade three, slightly worse. Also diffuse. Common location is also cerebral hemisphere. And uh, on histology, you see hypercellularity, and it's a little worse, so you also see some increased mitotic activity. Also no 1P, 19P codeletion. Again, to help you differentiate from oligodendrogliomas, which we'll get to in a second. Glioblastomas. This is another one of the bad ones. This is a grade four malignant tumor, also derived from astrocytes. Um, this one's the worst of the astrocyte tumors. Diffuse and infiltrative. So not only does it diffuse, invade, it infiltrates the surrounding brain tissue. Common location here is the cerebral hemispheres above the tectoral line, like the diffuse and anaplastic astrocytoma. Big feature here on imaging, CT and MRI, is that you can see a ring enhancing lesion. It's uh, as, as you can see in that bottom right image there, you can see the lesion and there's like the ring around it on MRI is, is lit is lighting up. This is because tumors have increased vasculature. They do a lot of angiogenesis. So you see that ring, you see that outer part of the, of the mass, the inner part of the mass is actually necrosis. It's dead tissue that is not going to light up. So you see ring enhancement on histology. There's quite a bit going on. 
you can see hypercellularity, way more blue than you're used to seeing, increased mitotic activity, just like anaplasmic astrocytoma. You also see microvascular proliferation, lots of angiogenesis again. There's also necrosis sometimes and pseudopalisating. This is uh, this means that the, the cells are sometimes aligned in, in a way that almost forms like a fence, that almost forms like a defined border. And you can kind of see that here. This is pseudopalisating down on histology on this bottom right image here. So you can kind of see that going on there. But definitely see microvascular proliferation, often see necrosis on histology. Some molecular features are mutations in EGFR and P10, worth knowing for glioblastoma, the worst of the astrocytomas. Grade 4 malignant tumor, pretty common too, as, as far as tumors go, at least. Next is oligodendrogliomas, comes from oligodendrocytes, grade 2 to 3. Common location is the cerebral hemispheres again. On histology, we see a fried egg appearance. This means that you have a, uh, a nucleus surrounded by a halo like uh, feature around the nucleus, a perinuclear halo. Uh, it's also important to note that on histology, you can stain for astrocyte markers, and these cells would come up negative. So, this is how you, this is one way you can differentiate oligodendrogliomas from the astrocyte cancers. Molecularly, here you do have the 1p19q decoda lesion, unlike the astrocytomas. So, that helps you differentiate it as well. Next is tumor of ependymal cells called ependymoma. This is another grade two to three malignant tumor coming in the cerebellum and the spinal cord below the tectoral line. This one is, unlike the others, other few that we've been talking about, is well circumscribed, so it's not diffuse. It's not going to be invading. This, like the medulloblastoma, can drop metastases and seed the CSF. On histology here, we see some characteristic rosettes. We see perivascular rosettes, which are pendomomal cells surrounding the vasculature, and then we also see ependymal rosettes, which as... Uh, as, as you might expect, it's surrounding a uh, like like a small piece of ventricle, like the ependymal cells usually do. You can see some of those rosettes on histology here. Here's what looks to be a perivascular rosette. There are cells surrounding what looks like a blood vessel. Next is meningiomas. These are grade one, also pretty benign, no big deal. Tumor of adults, you do not see these in children. Unlike medulloblastoma, ependymoma, uh, these, these are rare, very, very rare in children. Tumor of adults. This is more common in females. People think it's because there are progesterone and estrogen receptors on, uh, on these tumors. So they might be responding to some hormones. Uh, they might be growing in response to some hormones. Either way, meningioma is more common in females. Uh, you also see dural tails here. So these come from the meninges. The dura mater is part of the meninges. And um, when you see it grow, as you can see here, it kind of comes off of the meninges. This part is called the dural tail. It's an extension of the dura that kind of wraps around the meningioma. These are also notable because they're extra axial. They're out of the brain parenchyma. They're not actually in uh, the brain tissue. They're just outside of it, pushing on it, sometimes causing a mass effect. These can invade bone, and uh, less frequently, they infect the brain tissue itself. On histology, you see cellular whorls, as you can see in that top image there. You also see somoma bodies, which are calcium deposits uh, that, that, that these tumors lay out. Uh, cellular whorls are characteristic. You can see kind of like a, like a spiral shape of cells on histology. Next is neurofibromas. This is the first of the two peripheral tumors that we're going to be talking about. This is associated with neurofibromas type excuse me, neurofibromatosis type 1 genetic disorder. Uh, characteristic lesions across the body here are cafe or lay spots, which are uh, darker nodules, hyperpigmentation across the body. Uh, leash nodules also appear in the eye. As you can see in that image above, those are like petal-like formations in the iris. On histology, you see a shredded carrot appearance. This is collagen strands in the, uh, in the fibroma. So it helps to remember that the neurofibroma has fibrous collagen strands that look like shredded carrots on histology, as you can see in that bottom image. And lastly are the schwannomas. This is the second of the peripheral tumors that we're going to be talking about. Schwannomas can be associated with neurofibromatosis type 2. This correlation between schwannomas and neurofibromatosis type 2 isn't quite as strong as NF1 and neurofibromas. Uh, so uh, still there, still helpful to know. On histology for schwannomas, you see varicrae bodies. Varicrae bodies are palisading cells surrounding an acellular zone. Palisading means, as I mentioned earlier, cells lined up in a fence-like formation. Uh, in this case, this is true palisading, so there, there's a very well-defined fence, and it's easy to see the difference between this fence-like structure of cells and the surrounding acellular zone. 
also on histology, you see biphasic appearance. This means that some part of the histology is going to be hypercellular and some part is going to be hypocellular. The hypercellular regions, as you can see in that top of that image on the right there, is called Antony A. That's hyper, or, excuse me, that's actually at the bottom of that image on the right there. That's called Antony A. There are more cells there. And, uh, kind of obvious that there are less cells toward the top, and that's hypocellular called Antony B. And these two regions are characteristic of schwannomas, and it's called a biphasic neoplasm. One common type of schwannoma is a vestibular schwannoma. And this is uh, when a schwannoma arises from cranial nerve eight. It causes all kinds of hearing problems and balance problems, as you might expect. Cranial nerve eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is responsible for your sense of hearing and your sense of position, balance, gravity, stuff like that, coming from the vestibulo and the cochlear sections of the ear. Now, this vestibular schwannoma is often called an acoustic neuroma, which is wrong for a few reasons. It's not really a neuron. It's not, it's not really a neuroma. It's, uh, it's actually coming from a schwann cell, so it's a schwannoma. And secondly, it's not really from the acoustic part of cranial nerve 8. It's more from the vestibular part of cranial nerve 8. So vestibular schwannomas, as I mentioned earlier, give you hearing problems and equilibrium problems. That's it for this summary of tumors of the nervous system. I hope this summary of tumors was helpful.